Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I'm Kelvin Thompson. I'm joined here with my colleague Dr. Linda Futch, who will speak to you in just a moment. And keeping us on track as best as he can, our technical advisor, John Pizzo. And uh, we have three outstanding guests that we'll introduce to you more formally in just a moment. Uh, Wilma Hodges, Jen Dalby, and Alex Pickett. But first, just a little bit of scene setting for you. Uh, here's what we're going to do today. Here's our little agenda. Just for those who don't already have the context, we're going to talk very briefly about um, the BlendKit course and specifically BlendKit 2016. We're going to, most of the time, hear from our three guests about uh, the local cohort option for BlendKit. And then we're going to give you a little bit of, of uh, upselling. We're going to try to uh, persuade you that the local cohort option is a really good thing, and there are some perks for you for pursuing that. And then we'll talk concretely about action steps and give a chance to answer some questions. So uh, hopefully everything is OK. Give us a little bit of feedback on um, sound levels as we go using the chat. Um, and uh, feel free to chat at any point with questions. We'll catch up with any lingering questions at the appropriate time. And with no further ado, my colleague Linda Futch here to give us a little bit of context on BlendKit. Linda? OK, everybody. How are you today? Uh, John, would you go to the next slide? OK, my job is to kind of introduce you to the BlendKit. And we're going to go to the next slide, John. Can I do it? OK. Um, first of all, the goals of the Blend Kit is, first of all, to help individuals design and develop a blended learning course. We're going to consider some key issues related to blended learning. And then there is some practical guides for actually producing materials. And so the goal is to have some content actually created for the course at the point that they get through there. And then also there's a lot of feedback from peer institutions from each other as you're going when we do these groups of cohorts. Um, the material in the Blend Kit, there are, number one, some instructional models. There is um, a reader in there for each of the topic areas. And the do-it-yourself assignments, these are the practical applications where you actually have some documents where you're trying to put a course together. We do have interviews with some existing interviews with faculty who are experienced blended learning um, faculty members. And then at the end of each week, there is an actual live webinar that is recorded as well with uh, two faculty members who have experience in blended learning. And they answer any questions that have come up from the participants during the week. So first, you have a set of existing um, interviews, and then you'll have a brand new set that will be recorded as we go along. And for those who've never been to BlendKit, you see the URL. There's a bit.ly right there. It's bit.ly slash BlendKit, and that will take you to the actual course. It's actually live out there all the time. It sits out on the website, but the cohort we're going to be running will actually be inside the Canvas network. Um, some of the t five topics that we cover during the course is one, understanding with learning interactions, assessments, content assignments, and then quality assurance. So we cover all five of those topics. Of course, that doesn't cover everything in regard to a blended course, but those are the key topics. Uh, we do have a partnership with EDUCAUSE. And so once people have actually completed the five weeks of the course, they have the option to go for a certificate. And in order to do that, the two requirements are one to um, complete the blended learning course, and then to submit some information for the um, for a portfolio review. And so the this EDUCAL certificate will, one, give you a paper certificate, and then also a badge issue from EDUCAUSE. And then the mastery, there is a bunch of artifacts that come out of the course, and those are all submitted to for the portfolio, and then there has to be a reflection there to kind of tie it all together, since blended learning is both a face-to-face -face and an online portion. The cost for the portfolio is $89. Now, the portfolio is an option. It's not a requirement, but it's, it's just an option if somebody wants that recognition. So it depends on whether that is of value to that particular person. 
Um, also, last year we had a lot of people asking for tenu continuing education credit, so we've decided to add that this year. Uh, there will be one quick credit for the people who complete all the DIY tasks in the Blend Kit, and then there will be another credit if they choose to submit a portfolio and, com and successfully complete it. So that's for a total of two credits, and the certificates for the CEUs is $25 for the certificates, so whether you get one or both credits, you use $25. And I will turn it over to Kelvin now. Thanks very much, Linda. And again, as, as we proceed, if you have any questions about BlendKit generically, feel free to post those in the chat, and we will address those during uh, our Q&A time. Now, the BlendKit course materials live online in perpetuity under a Creative Commons license. So really, at any point, you could feel free to uh, take those materials and add them to your own faculty development programs or or just to go through it exactly as designed as uh, a complete faculty development program for blended learning. But what we hear from most people is, yeah, I know I could do that, but I don't have time to do that. So when since you guys do these cohorts, I would just, just as soon come along and, and, and join you. And so over the years, we've done this now, uh, BlendKit 2011, 2012, 2014, 2015. We've done it four times, getting ready for our fifth time. And over the last couple of years, we've had a, about 2,500 people from around the world in each cohort. But what has been really neat to see is what individuals will do at their own institutions, whether that is having a cup of coffee with a, a colleague who's going through at the same time and just sort of touching base uh, as a very informal thing. And if we think about this as a, as a continuum, way on one side is informal. Could be as simple as, is, well, I'm going to go through the reader. What did you think about that, that second chapter? Linda, was that pretty good? What do you think? Oh, I didn't agree with that at all. And, and that kind of an informal dialogue. Or all the way through um, uh, institutions who decide they're going to pay financial incentives to faculty members who um, uh, participate in uh, a local cohort for blend kit and actually pay for uh, the portfolio review that Linda talked about, or anywhere in between. And so we've noticed that, but we've never really gotten behind it and pushed. So this year, we're going to get behind it and push. Why is that? Primarily because we have observed that innately there is value in whether it's uh, one colleague or 20 colleagues, having some kind of a local connection uh, brings about a higher degree of accountability. Uh, for you as a participant, uh, and it allows things to begin to happen with blended learning at your institution. The more there are people on the same page with blended learning, with a shared vocabulary, a shared set of practices, it's, it can be a catalyst. We've seen that happen again and again through little stories that people tell us. So our guests today, uh, two of them have done this before in their own contexts at institutions, they have either less formally or more formally facilitated cohorts. And our third guest is great, Dr. Alexandra Pickett, uh, is poised, contemplating like some of you, hmm, do I want to do a cohort like this at my, in her case, system, or in your case, institution? And she will share with us what her thoughts are uh, about the process. And then, of course, um, will carry on with uh, some action steps for you. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce our first case study uh, with Wilma Hodges. Uh, Wilma is currently the Director of Training and E-Learning Initiatives at Longsight, um, a, an organization that uh, brings about wraparound services for open source software. But formerly, she was the Manager for Distance Learning Services uh, at, at a sister institution in our Central Florida area at Seminole State College of Florida. And you can tweet Wilma using the, the, the handle that you see on screen there. With no further ado, uh, Wilma, you can advance your own slides down at the bottom left-hand corner, or if you'd like us to, let us know. Otherwise, here you go. Okay, great. Thanks, Calvin. Um, so, um, Kelvin asked me to talk a little bit about the cohort that I ran. This was back in 2012. And um, probably one of the first questions you might be asking is why organize a cohort? Um, I know Kelvin touched on it a little bit, but um, for my particular institution, there was a lot of interest on campus in blended learning. 
but faculty really needed a little bit of a nudge to get going with it. Um, you know, I could point out the blend kit materials, they were all freely available, but they really needed, you know, a little bit more to actually um, go out and, and make good use of the material. Not everyone was motivated to go out and sort of seek that sort of experience and follow it through on their own. So having something local on campus really uh, encouraged people who were maybe on the fence or maybe um, just so busy that they couldn't carve out the time if there was something sort of structured or at least semi-structured that they could participate in on campus, it was a, a good incentive to get them involved. And another reason that I found is that it, having people on campus that they knew that were going through the same uh, you know, series of, of webinars, the same activities, really gave them like a, a local support group to talk with, to kind of bounce ideas off of, added a little more weight to the experience because it can, you can sometimes feel a little bit lost in a MOOC because they are so big and you may feel a little bit isolated that you're out there sort of doing these things um, in isolation at your you know, regional area. So having a group of people that were doing it at the same time was really beneficial to help them um, move along through it together. So what I did um, basically, it was pretty simple. We had a weekly meeting that kind of kept pace with the blend kit cohort that was running that year. Uh, we met for an hour and a half. And it turned out, actually, that Fridays were better for our faculty. So we ended up doing our meetings on Fridays, even though the, um, the recorded webinars were on, I think, Mondays. So we were a little off sync with the actual webinars. But what we did was um, we actually recorded our sessions on campus, and then those were also available later. Um, I'll go into that a little bit more about what we actually did during those sessions. Um, and we used our. Um, campus LMS to organize the blend kit materials so that they were easily accessible to folks right alongside the courses that they were teaching. They didn't have to leave their LMS to go somewhere else to find the materials. It was sort of embedded in what they were touching almost every day anyway. So it made it the threshold for participation a little bit lower. Um, and, and as Kelvin mentioned, uh, Seminole State is only about a half hour from UCF. So it was really great that we were able to have um, guest speakers a, a couple of, of times during our sessions. Um, Calvin and Linda were able to come over and actually talk with our faculty. And they actually, I think Calvin um, came for the showcase at the end that we had, um, where we, at the end of the five weeks, um, we had a meeting where faculty could kind of share what they'd learned over the course of the blend kit, um, you know, showcase anything that they had developed, and we actually provided lunch for them as another you know, kind of bonus um, for, uh, for attending and sharing what they had um, experienced. So I'm going to show you just a few screenshots. These are from our LMS, um, which is Sakai. Um, and what I did is I just linked a lot of the resources that were already available out there. Um, within the, the LMS. So most of these are just links. Um, but I did include on the sort of home page for the course links to our session recordings. So every week we would have a, a meeting, and then I would link the recording for that week there right on the home page. So if somebody couldn't make it a particular week and they wanted to catch up with um, our on-campus discussion, they could do so uh, from those recording links. And it also had all the dates so people could remember you know, when to, um, to plan to attend. And as I mentioned, I had links to the other external resources right within the course site. So um, even though the materials were gathered together in our local LMS, we really had a lot of links out to those resources where people could share what they were doing with the wider MOOC community. So we didn't want to restrict their ability to participate in all aspects of it. We just wanted to make it easy for people to, to get in there and start working on it. So what we did during those um, hour and a half or so sessions on Fridays is we would actually gather together. We had a, a computer lab on campus uh, where we would watch the webinar for that week. Because as I mentioned, we were a little out of sync on the day of the week that the webinar ran. So we actually watched the recording for that week. Um, but uh, there were some asynchronous polls that were sort of sprinkled throughout. So what we would do is we would start off you know, watching the recording. And then when we got to one of those polls, I would actually pause the recording 
and we would all, you know, we'd either fill it out as a group or people would pull up um, on their computers uh, at their stations and fill them out individually and submit those polls as they went along. So they still got the sense of, you know, participating in a somewhat live um, type of activity. And then um, after the webinar, we'd have a few minutes for discussion about the topic for that week um, and the readings for that week. And then we would actually do the focus question, uh, which was a blogging question. We did the blogs as a group. So um, once we had a, a few minutes for discussion after watching the webinar together, I would actually give them you know, about 15, 20 minutes to actually um, blog about it. And we blogged using the blog tool within the LMS so that um, they could kind of have a central location to go back and, and comment on other folks posts and, and read what was blogged about that week. Um, and this was also available to um, you know, folks on campus who signed up to participate. They could come back to this later and, and view people's logs, blogs. Um, then we would, um, I, I did have a link to the Google Doc that was out there for um, sharing your blog. I don't recall, actually, I think maybe one person took us up on it as far as sharing their internal blog out to the wider world. Um, but, but that was available. We did kind of try to nudge them to, to go ahead and share it to a more wider uh, community. And then um, the DIY tasks for each week, um, we actually completed those in the forums. What I had is a forum discussion area set up for each week. And as their homework, um, they were supposed to go and do their DIY and then post um, you know, either a response to it or if they had like an artifact like their mix map or you know, a syllabus or something like that, they would actually attach that to their discussion post and then um, people could comment on each other's um, DIY materials as they worked through the course. Now not everybody did all of the DIY tasks because they were all optional. Um, but we found that uh, the folks that did, I think, got, got a lot out of it. And other people, even if they didn't complete the task, they could look and see what other folks had done. And it gave them you know, more ideas for how to complete it um, for their own discipline. So some of the value that I found that was added going through it in a local cohort is that it gave people a dedicated time and place to participate. Um, I know a lot of the, the problem with you know, participating in MOOCs is, is simply time management. We all get so busy with so many different things going on that sometimes it's hard to carve out that time and set it aside for doing this activity. But knowing that there was a place on campus that they needed to be once a week and their you know, um, peer faculty were going to be there, it made them a little more accountable, made them you know, set aside that time for professional development so that they could actually engage with it and, and get more out of it. Uh, they also had an opportunity to connect with other people on campus, maybe in another discipline who they normally wouldn't have a whole lot of contact with, but, um, but they're both developing blended courses or teaching blended courses, so they had a lot of commonalities there even if they weren't teaching in the same discipline. Um, and as I mentioned, we have recordings of, of the sessions. So people could still you know, watch those and feel like part of their local cohort as well as the larger group, even if they missed a session. Um, they weren't sort of left out. They could um, kind of catch up with our local meetings as well. Um, so some of the outcomes, we, uh, you know, it, it was somewhat informal, the whole process. We didn't provide um, CEUs or anything like that at that point. I think this was actually before they started doing the EDUCAUSE um, badges. There were some badges that you could earn. Uh, I think they were just uh, awarded through Credly, if I believed, or Mozilla Open badges, one of the two. Um, but you could earn badges that way. That was before the more official badge was available. But we did have a few people who went through and earned the badges. Um, we had about 10 to 12 faculty who participated regularly throughout the whole uh, process. And everybody who attended um, had really positive things to say about it. They all really thought it was a, a useful exercise, um, particularly going through it as a group. And several of the faculty who were involved went on to teach blended courses for the first time. They actually used some of those DIYs to develop things that they were going to implement right away. Or they were maybe already teaching a blended class, and they used it to enhance some of their existing materials. So. Um, 
that is pretty much it, unless there are any questions that I can answer right now. Thanks so much, Wilma. That's awesome. Um, now, we're going to switch gears a little bit and hear from our colleague, Jen Dalby. Uh, at the time of BlendKit 2014, Jen was Director of eLearning at Lake Washington Institute of Technology in the Seattle, Washington area, LW Tech, we call it for short. Uh, now, and there must be something in the water, now uh, Jen works for uh, Kuali Ready, uh, or works for Kuali Co, which um, is a, a company that has wraparound services for open source software. I don't know what's happening in the water here, but uh, uh, that's, that's, that's fascinating, that kind of a trend. But Jen is going to tell us a little bit about her experience with a, with a much more uh, robust and formalized um, initiative at her former institution. Jen? Thanks, Kelvin. I've actually done this um, a, a few different ways. I've done it anywhere along that con continuum. And I originally started just remixing the content once I discovered you were licensing it, Creative Commons, and using that as part of my uh, typical training for new faculty coming into blended learning and as they were learning to use the LMS. So uh, I think I got started with a formal in fall of 2013 by running it as a one credit course on campus. I just remixed the materials there and ran a cohort. And uh, one of the things I was just remembering is that the week of Thanksgiving, we had a face-to-face -face session scheduled the Wednesday afternoon before the Thanksgiving break, and it was packed with people because they were so excited to work together and to connect with other colleagues. And that's what um, really got me interested in making it more formal with um, BlendKit 2014. So when the announcement came out that there was a partnership with Educause uh, for the, the credential, I thought that would be a great incentive to get more people involved. I also realized um, as I was working on the budget spend down that I had some funds left over from some uh, courses that we had canceled uh, that were going to be taught by adjuncts. We'd shifted some things around. So I had some funding left over for faculty. And we decided to align with the uh, actual synchronous um, blend kit that was running and run a cohort along with the, the, uh, the live sessions. So um, we came up with the idea on, I think, a Wednesday and, or a Friday. And by the next Wednesday, we'd sent out an announcement to campus that we had openings for 25 people to participate. And we would fund uh, $700 of course development work as well as pay for the credential fee for folks. But there were only 25 openings. Well, it, it filled up pretty quickly, um, and I sent another announcement that we had room for more, and I told leadership that um, somebody was going to have to come up with the funds to pay these people to attend, no matter how many. And I said, if I get 100 people in there, we're going to do it. <laughs> I think we ended up with about 30, 32 who signed up, and we had 28 complete, including myself and one of my colleagues in the e-learning office. And the way we set it up, we wanted to be very inclusive. We had, um, I think, 70 to 80 percent part-time faculty at the time. And um, I wanted them to feel a part of the professional development. So the only requirements I had were that the faculty had to be teaching that term and want to teach at the college in future terms. I knew that a lot of them weren't sure what their future contracts would be like, and I didn't want them to feel left out. So uh, we kind of just opened it up to everybody who was interested and accepted anyone who was willing to take it on. We promoted it and let them know that it would take four or five hours per week of work. Uh, and it was quite a bit of effort. In order to earn the, the funding for the modules they were developing, they were required to attend um, two face-to-face -face sessions because we wanted them to experience uh, what it was like to be a student in blended learning. They had to um, participate in um, all of the 
weekly sessions for the blend kit, uh, completing one assignment each week to earn the fee. Uh, they had to also do a one-on-one, -on -one, one-hour consultation with either myself or our curriculum manager uh, for a course development consultation. And they had to submit all of their content as Creative Commons licensed, um, what we call the course kit. So what we did was modify the materials a little bit to create templates that would align with the way uh, our curriculum was set up within the institution. Didn't take too much modification. The materials that come with a blend kit course are, are pretty good as a framework for uh, developing blended learning courses. We wanted to walk away with a nice collection of course materials that could be reused by other faculty. So it, it, they were required to uh, complete the portfolio work and submit um, by the end of the course so they could earn that credential. We paid for the credential for them. Um, we, ran, we would run in our e-learning office the weekly live sessions as they were broadcast for the blend kit course. So the faculty could come and meet there and attend that. We would also conduct a, a second live session at a different time during the week that was just our local co cohort in case they weren't able to attend the, the one from UCF. And then um, I think we, we peppered in a few other uh, live sessions so they could come in as a group so they could all meet those requirements. And then they each had to schedule their one-on-one -on -one sessions. We ended up with 28, I think a collection of 28 full course kits for all different courses. And uh, I think we funded 26 people that we didn't pay myself and my colleague from eLearning to participate, but we did fund, uh, I think, the 26 folks who did complete it. We were very grateful to the UCF folks for helping us with our cohort and, um, you know, especially taking care of the payment and, and working out all of the logistics for it. But um, it, it was a really valuable experience, something that I definitely would recommend. We got great feedback from the faculty. They absolutely loved that they got to meet each other. Um, personally, that was the most valuable thing to me was uh, letting the conversation go. You know, we, we guided it the first few times we met, but after that, just letting them talk to each other and find um, co-curricular areas where they were working on things that they could share and things that they had in common that they, they could work on together. As a quick overview, I've got uh, plenty of resources I'm happy to share with people if they want to reach out and contact me after, but I'll, I'll hand it back over to Kelvin. Thanks so much, Jen. I appreciate that. And I, I just want to pause for a second and say that, you know, seriously, and I hope uh, all of you here in real time with us or who are accessing this recording after the fact recognize how cool this is. I, I get excited every single time I think about uh, people like Wilma and Jen and others that Linda and I have met through the years. These folks are, are, are truly like heroes to me. I think, how cool is that, right? To, to go out, look outside of your immediate context, find something. Yeah, I mean, it's stuff that we're involved with. That's great for us. But find something and bring it back in and make something happen. Uh, bring uh, context. Uh, right there at the institution. I love that, the, the whole contingent faculty adjunct thing, the part-time, you know, making something happen for them. Adjuncts are often left hanging. So it, that, that's great. So many, so many great stories. And I just put a, uh, a little link in the chat room there to call out. We've, we've captured some stories, not nearly enough, on the BlendKit website. Um, of stories of individuals that they've shared with us, stories of institutions, and we need to update it a little bit. But that gives you a little smattering of, of the kind of things that people have done through the years. All right, so we're going to turn our attention, now shift gears a little bit. We've heard from Wilma and Jen what they've done in the local context using uh, the BlendKit materials and the BlendKit global cohort. We're going to turn our attention uh, to my friend and colleague, Dr. Alexandra Pickett. Alex. Uh, is, is a force uh, to be reckoned with at Open SUNY. 
uh, where she's an associate director for Open SUNY Center for Online Teaching Excellence, or COAT, uh, an acronym that I mess up often, but I will get right today. Uh, and you'll find Alex uh, on Twitter, at, uh, at Alex Pickett. And Alex, I just want to put you on the spot and just ask you to maybe share with us a little bit where you're at in your thinking. Uh, we've talked about this a little bit. You're, you're, you're seeing maybe some value at, uh, at SUNY with um, uh, something at the local level around BlendKit. And you've heard now Wilma and Jen share some of their stories. So I wonder if you just kind of talk us through your thought process now. Really thrilled that you invited me to, um, to uh, participate in this and to hear the other two uh, case studies. Um, and the range of types of things that people have been doing um, to uh, uh, bring uh, local cohorts into um, the live MOOC that you guys are providing. And it's just very exciting for me to think about the possibilities of what we might do at SUNY uh, in order to um, bring cohorts uh, from our SUNY campuses to um, leverage uh, that um, that blend kit 2016 um, uh, uh, event that you guys are going to be uh, conducting. Um, so let me just back up a little bit and, and tell you a little bit about our context. I lead the Open SUNY Center for Online Teaching Excellence. Um, what we do is support online practitioners across the SUNY system, which is a 64 campus system. Um, with uh, institutions ranging, ranging from community colleges to doctoral institutions, and there's 64 of them. Um, th at the system level, um, that's where COAT, Open SUNY Center for Online Teaching Excellence, sits. Um, and we work in collaboration with our SUNY campuses and the local online faculty development and online instructional design support staff to um, uh, develop online faculty and, and online courses um, with some centralized supports and services. So COAT consists of four pillars. Community of practice is one of them. Online course supports is another. Innovation and research is another. And online camp competency development is the fourth. And Online competency development is really where I see BlendKit um, uh, uh, fitting in. Um, it's all of our uh, faculty development and course design um, uh, initiatives uh, live in that particular pillar. Um, uh, BlendKit was a fellow NGLC grantee, by the way. And so that's how I became aware of the program. And so when we were looking at developing um, um, curriculum for blended learning uh, for our competency development initiatives at, at the system level. Uh, I, you know, remembered uh, BlendKid and had seen, you know, over the years, a couple of years, had heard and kept in in touch uh, with Calvin and Linda uh, and others from UCF. Um, and so my thinking was, why reinvent the wheel? This stuff is awesome. It's like covered in awesome sauce. And then, you know, any opportunity to like hang out with Calvin, I, I'm there, right? So um, I love the idea that um, there uh, can be um, local campus um, initiatives that wrap around the, um, the MOOC experience. And so our campuses could do something informal or they could go for the more formal um, approach and anything in between. And so I'm excited to see um, what potential interest there is on our campuses. And I see among the participants um, at least uh, two, um, if I'm reading the names correctly, um, that are representing some of our SUNY campuses. We will have the, this recording that we'll make available to people um, to, to uh, get um, their, um, you know, uh, in, to inform them and, and uh, kind of gauge interest from campuses. Um, I 
I really see this as great potential, um, that, that it has great potential to meet um, a variety of professional development needs at our campuses in the um, blended learning area. And so what we plan to do is to, like I said, make the um, uh, rec this recording uh, available. And then also, you know, at one of our pillars is community of practice, and we have regular um, phone meetings with uh, with our community. And so uh, every month we have a, a, a call uh, where at least you know 30 to 40 people join that call weekly, and we gather together to talk about different issues that are relevant to um, uh, online teaching and learning or the support of online teaching and learning on our campuses. And so we'll pull that group together and talk about who uh, might be interested uh, in pulling together a cohort and what the wraparound um, uh, activities, the local wraparound activities might look like um, for them to do some of the cool stuff that like was described by Jen and Wilma um, to support that initiative um, locally uh, at the campus. So I'm, I'm just very excited about the possibilities and, and about the opportunity for us to uh, bring a really high quality um, experience to, uh, in terms of professional development for our faculty um, uh, to uh, our local campuses, um, to, to leverage the local aspect of it for all of the community building activities, but also to leverage that MOOC um, community building uh, um, uh, aspect of it. Um, I really think that there is, and I think you know the other two speakers uh, mentioned it, that there's value to having um, you know your faculty participate in a group larger than uh, uh, you know, outside of the context of your own institution, but then also have that um, opportunity to gain uh, the benefits of the community of practice within your local context as well. I'm very excited about this. So that, Alex, that's awesome. And uh, I'm going to invite, again, I typed it in the chat room, and I'll invite everyone, if you have questions, thoughts, like, I wonder how that worked, and, or why did you do that? If you, uh, if you have questions for Wilma or Jen or uh, Alex, go ahead and, and um, note those in the, the chat room. Um, and we will, as a group, address those in uh, just a few uh, minutes. But to give you time to type that up, Linda and I will um, go through and hit a couple of perks for registered cohorts and uh, some suggested action steps. Now, meanwhile, for all of our uh, co-presenters, if you would just make sure that you are muted, uh, unless it's your turn at that here, that will be good. So I think we're getting a little bit of um, uh, rustling noise in the background from somebody's open mic. Uh, first, I'll just comment again. Think back to that um, that uh, continuum slide that I showed you before. This could be a range of options, from informal to formal. Um, Wilma and Jen shared some things that are a little bit more formalized. Maybe Jen's was a bit more formal than Wilma, but Wilma's still, she scheduled and she organized and she pulled into a learning management system. It, it could be less formal than that. It could literally be a little coffee clatch, right? And you sit around and you, you gather and you're just going to talk through, well, how did you do in the blend kit this past week? Or, or just have uh, the, the reader. The reader just has weekly discussion questions. You could just meet, read through a chapter, and have a little book club. You could do that. That would be fine. So just think about what works for you. So as we talk about registered cohorts here in the next couple of minutes, think about what's going to make sense for you, not necessarily what Jen or Wilma did, not necessarily what Alex is thinking about doing, but think about your context. That being said, uh, Linda, why don't you start uh, talking us through here? OK. Um, I see a couple questions coming up, and we'll address those shortly once we get through this next section. OK, so perks for registered cohorts. Um, first of all, you're going to get some additional customized resources to use on your campus. One would be a flyer to take out, but also just some handouts and things that you could use and suggestions to help organize your cohort. Also, we'll provide you with an individual consultation on blended learning for your institution if you have 10 participants, participants or more in this cohort. Then we'd end up with a final wrap-up wrap webinar. 
for all the cohorts registered in with a point of contact about how to move forward on the bling kit. So once we've got through, how can you actually put this all together and try and make it, keep it going for your group? Okay, so action steps. First of all, we want you to register as a point of contact. So if you're going to be the one who's going to organize this group, you're the point of contact. So you'll need to register for that. And we have a link to this registration form shortly. Next, consider uh, what cohort option is going to be work best for your institution. Where are you on that continuum that Kelvin talked about? Uh, then you'd want to promote it with your local cohort, get people to register. You can either register them in in the course or you can have them individually register, but we would ask you to send us in addition and we'll provide you with a spreadsheet that you can use to let us know who your active group is. And then you need to stay active with the group and keep them going, um, have them, having them meet regularly and in, in talking together. Okay, here's the link to the local cohort group. So if you're ready to sign up, you can go ahead and register there as the point of contact. If you still have some questions, uh, feel free to send a message to Kelvin or I, and we'll be happy to get back with you and talk to you or have one of our other Blinkit people get back to you to talk to you. So now time for some questions. Great, Linda. Thanks. One thing I'll mention about the URL that's on screen there is um, that is case sensitive. So to go to that uh, point of contact form, that's bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash capital P, capital O, capital C, underscore blend kit local. And I'll put that in the chat room in just a moment as well. Now, I'll just say again, even if you're halfway thinking that maybe you might want to do this, go fill out the form. Skip anything that's not relevant, fill it out, because we'll stay in touch with you. We'll give you a chance to follow up. We even have some questions in there to help us um, get a better sense of what's happening at your institution, and we might have some suggestions for you. Okay. Uh, that being said, why don't we turn our attention to some of the, the questions that have, that have come in. Now, some of those I've seen a little bit of um, uh, addressing in the, chats al in the chat room already. Um, I believe Kathleen asked about uh, whether it's appropriate for instructional designers to participate in BlendKit as well. And yes, uh, Linda will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think historically, Linda, we look at our questionnaire data, uh, like a full 40%, I think, on average, when each cohort of our uh, global participants are some kind of instructional designers or faculty developers. Does that sound about right? That's correct. And we see instructional designers from higher ed as well as from the business community. Yeah, that's right. So that would totally be appropriate. And then I think um, uh, Jen's comment that she typed in the, the chat room makes a lot of sense, too, where she said, well, you know, I, I was participating right there alongside our teaching faculty, and that, that makes a, a lot of sense. Uh, Alex asked if we would review um, the fees again, and I typed a response, but I'll say here again. The only fees involved are um, if you choose to go for the co-branded EDUCAUSE and UCF certificate, kind of a serious digital badge and a certificate, print certificate. Uh, that is $89 for the portfolio review process. Um, for what I should say, for this year for the continuing education unit, CEUs, it's just $25 if you want CEUs. Uh, if you are pursuing that, that's meaningful to you. Then if you um, engage with the do-it-yourself DIY tasks, and we can document um, that engagement, that's one CEU. If you also are choosing to go for that portfolio, then that's uh, a second CEU, but you only pay one $25 fee uh, for up to two CEUs. I hope that makes sense. Uh, and yes, Jen, thank you for uh, posting the link to the materials that, that you created. That's awesome. And uh, I think Jen mentioned this, but I know that she, like Wilma, had done some uh, LMS contextualization as well. I think that's a good practice. You don't have to do that, but uh, like Wilma said, it, it, it allows uh, folks at your own institution to be in a familiar environment digitally um, without even having, even having to engage in the, um, uh, the sort of the global LMS. Now, the, um, uh, the course was a little bit um, uh, different when uh, Wilma's cohort went through. And uh, I think Jen could speak to this, but Jen, I think your folks had to do a little bit in your institutional LMS and then a little bit in our blend kit LMS in order to, to get kind of credit for their work, I, I believe. Is that right, Jen? 
Yeah, they had to do the submissions in the official LMS site so that they could get credit from you all. And um, we also had some stuff set up in ours as well. And that would hold true for this session. Um, they do have to go into the Canvas Network LMS to submit things for the Blinkit MOOC. Um, there are actually five assignments they can submit each week, and you get a badge for each of the assignments. But you don't have to do all five. You could do just one of those each week, and you will complete the course. And there is no charge for the course itself. Right. So the, the course completion criteria are fairly minimal. There are up to 25 badges that you could earn uh, during the course, uh, but only one badge, one assignment, one activity per week uh, is required in order to complete the course. But if you want to go for that, that, uh, that certificate, uh, then, uh, then the portfolio option, which is, a, which is a, a, a more robust level of engagement and of, of um, uh, of uh, performance-based evidence is, is necessary. What other questions uh, do you all have? Or what other reactions do uh, Alex or Jen or Wilma do you have? That's great, Jen. Thanks. And, and again, uh, I would say that's a hallmark of this whole activity, this whole open online course thing. People are so generous with their time and with their resources. It's really neat to, to see. Uh, one person bubbling up something that somebody else can use. That's, that's great. I should also give a shout out that uh, one of the BlendKit 2016 co-facilitators, Dr. Baiwen Chen, is on the uh, webinar with us today. Um, at least she was a moment ago. Let me scroll up, make sure she's still, still there and still awake. Yes, OK. Um, Baiwen, I don't know if you want to um, say hello to everybody. Um, and uh, make any comments about today's webinar or the upcoming uh, cohort globally or not. But uh, I see you're typing. No worries. Thanks, by when. OK, well, if there are no more questions right now, I'll just draw your attention to some of the contact on the screen here. Uh, I think all of our participants today would be happy to engage with you either via email or Twitter. Everybody's kind of Twitter active. It's kind of like radioactive, only with less um, life-threatening uh, potential. The, if you're on Twitter, then feel free to tweet with the hashtag BlendKit2016 as we get going. Again, I don't know that we state, that stated this clearly, but the actual start date for BlendKit 2016 is February 22nd, 2016. And we'll run through the five weeks following that. And uh, then folks can walk away, or if you're going after the the portfolio, then there's a couple of extra weeks of portfolio activity uh, after that. And uh, the home base for everything BlendKit is bit.ly slash BlendKit. In fact, we'll even post the link to this uh, session's recording uh, there shortly after it's uh, done and processed. And if we can address any questions along the way, please let us know. But uh, soon, uh, next month, the uh, registration page for BlendKit 2016 will be open on the Canvas Network platform. So be watching Twitter, be watching the, the BlendKit page. But if you'd like to get a head start, you can certainly use the pre-registration form uh, that's on the BlendKit page as well. SUNY Nation. I love that, Alex. There we go. If no one else has any, any closing comments or final questions, then we will consider this closed. And on behalf of Linda, and John, uh, I will say thank you to our special guests, Wilma, Jen, and Alex. And thank you to all of you who gave up your time today in learning more about the local cohort option for BlendKit 2016. Thanks for joining us, and have a great rest of your day.